Hi, so the Killer Anthology just got released, the subject of this video that you just clicked on. So I don't know if you know, but it's a collection that repackages nine short games originally released individually that are about a girl named Bibi living in Strangetown, a city that seems to exist in a twisted version of our own reality. These games are notable for having incredibly good writing, amusing scenarios, excellent comedy, fantastic atmosphere, and even some effective horror. I would ultimately say these games fall into the horror comedy genre, but they're honestly kind of hard to describe. I doubt you've played anything exactly like these. As you can see, they're an interesting mix of cartoony 2D doodles existing in a 3D space. Gameplay is pretty much just wandering around experiencing this bizarre world and taking in the story. The creator is an infamous game dev, mostly known for Space Funeral, or if you're like me, Goblet Grotto. Goblet. Goblet. If you know anything about those two, then you have some idea what you're in for. Anyway, in this video we're just going to do a quick run through of all the games because I want to expose more people to these and get the discussion going. Because these are actually pretty deep and sometimes I can't determine what's going on because I'm drowning in an ocean of irony and satire. It's also a good opportunity to examine the new stuff that's been added in this repackaging. Now obviously there's spoilers in this video, but honestly I don't know if they matter much for this series. It's more about the experience and the story details, but you've been warned. Anyway, one more thing, before you go in, be careful. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll see you inside, uh, enjoy the games! We're introduced to our plucky main character, Bibi. She's a college gal, currently employed at a life insurance company. Right away, we're introduced to the writing style of this game, which is mostly presented to us through the observation Bibi has about the world around her. When you bump into these floating green eyes, Bibi will comment on something in the world. The writing is one of the main draws of this game series, and it's extremely snappy with a unique and dry sense of humor. The insight into Bibi's character through these observations makes her an extremely compelling main character, and throughout the course of the series, you will begin to feel like you know her very well. And she's very witty, so her perspective is a genuine treat. Almost immediately, we're hit with something that makes me genuinely angry. Just seeing the forward, forward, forward urgent makes my blood boil. If you've ever had a soul-crushing office job, you already know. Anyway, Bibi's main passion is publishing her magazine, or zine. These were apparently common in the pre-internet days and serve perhaps a similar purpose to internet blogs of the 21st century, allowing the publisher to curate some culture for the reader, writing about whatever they might choose. Now, Bibi's zine is all about revealing the mysterious happenings in the city and perhaps establishing a connection between them. And she's so committed to her zine, she's willing to endure a rough probationary period at her company to get extra dollars to print color pictures. Bibi thinks she's hit the jackpot with the printer room, but they're eternally busy pumping out literature about the life insurance policies in a world where the murder rate has climbed into the stratosphere. Anyway, Bibi's job is to make cold calls, and her target is 100 per day. Thankfully, gameplay only involves going through the first five with dreadful, dreadful results. Then, we head to the break room for some coffee. The radio is playing wham, and we see on the news a delightful story. Thousands of corpses found. That's some foreshadowing. Looking around the office, everyone wears an anonymity protecting sheet, and if we lose focus, we may succumb to the numbing effects of the environment. Gentle keyboard sounds, muffled speech, anxiety quelling music. Well, we're not getting anything done here. Time to go on the hunt for some leads. As we delve deeper into the bowels of the machine, things make less and less sense. Bibi doesn't recognize anything around her, and the game begins to take on a decidedly different tone. The world of the killer is an anxiety-laden schizophrenic nightmare. The office turns dark. It seems like our co-workers are out to get us. As the series progresses, in fact, it seems like everyone is out to get us. Yeah. We're inadvertently rescued by Cool Cop, a reoccurring character, so remember him. We wander further in search of our leads and find a group of managers has started a cult where they worship a mysterious killer. There's some sort of irony here that the managerial staff of a life insurance company worships a serial killer, but I can't quite place it. Bibi finally finds herself in her right place and slips into a trance, passing the day away, delivering scripts and cold calls. A dream that feels like waking from a dream. Well, that was the voice of the killer. For some reason, an online discussion, most people agree that it's the weakest of the nine, but I still love it because I think it's a great introduction to the world. 
It doesn't go too deep on the lore right away. It's got great atmosphere, great music, but it's time to move on because we got eight more of these to go. The game begins in Bibi's apartment, which she shares with her sister Zizi. Zizi has recently become an avid user of the internet and is discovered by selling random junk found around the apartment complex that can meet the demands of rent. Bibi, however, questions how random junk has any value. How does the system perpetuate itself? How exactly does the economy work? Bibi leaves to gather the mysterious Bort doll, and in this chapter were delivered more lore in the killer universe than the previous entry. The killer is so ubiquitous and borderline omnipresent that there's an anti-killer technology arms race every housing complex must compete in. Bibi and Zizi get good rent because the systems here are antiquated. Safety shutters come down at night, and Bibi remarks that the shutter blocking the elevator is scored and pitted by knife marks on both sides, leading us to wonder, is this killer some sort of supernatural beast? As we wander around, Bibi gives us her typical observations about the world, like how despite no one being around, the washing machines in the apartment complex run day and night. Truly, Bibi speaks for us all. Bibi finds what she seeks, an open vent with the mysterious footprints leading into it. She follows, and the game switches to a first-person vent crawling sequence where she must navigate an extremely claustrophobic system. Occasionally throughout these series, the games will switch to first-person segments, introduced here. Upon exit, Bibi explains to the player the nature of the building. With each new era of manufacturing, the building was simply layered upon piecemeal, closing old areas and opening new ones, leading to the structure being a complex archaeological dig, all of its own. Bibi says with each new layer, the things manufactured become more and more abstract, but we're looking to score optimal nostalgia window items from around 30 to 40 years old, so we have to go deep. As we wander around, you might notice these games have a pretty fantastic atmosphere. One of the strong suits of this game is the way it straddles genres, refusing classification. As we wander around these strange halls, there is an undeniable sense of danger, yes, but we can also find ourselves lulled into a calm flow state. These games seem to occupy a peculiar state of the mind somewhere between fear and calm, transitional emotion. These games exist in the liminal space of the mind. And indeed, it's hard to say where we are. Bibi will occasionally find things from our world, like a recording of a Steely Dan concert, but surely this can't be our world, right? We don't live in the murderverse, do, do we? Eventually, deep inside the heart of the building, we find a door where Bibi is asked the question, are you Donald Duck? Whatever we answer, we get our jump scare. This time we're apprehended by a bunch of researchers. The way these academics operate is a scathing criticism of academia at large. So in the span of two short chapters, the Catamites has critiqued corporate culture, the police, and now academia? Is no one safe? Anyway, these academics have mistaken Bibi for a doll and planned a dissector here to research whatever might be inside. Apparently there's an obscure doll line called My First Strangle Victim that Bibi happens to look exactly like. Bibi herself seems unaware of this fact, which leads to the question, what is Bibi anyway? Is she just a normal human that happens to be yellow? I mean, that cop earlier was pink purple. I've seen some people say she's a bunny or a mouse, but I think those ears are actually just a bow. Could it really be that Bibi is some sort of doll, animated and brought to life by some foul magic? Fortunately, the academics wouldn't waste time with something as tried as knots, and Bibi can break free easily. She must then wander the halls of a nightmarish art installation slash research facility, and yep, turns out these guys all worship murder. It seems as though they wish to usher in a new age or are endeavoring to find all kind of arts to do so. As Bibi runs around, we see her from the perspective of the head researcher, delivering a lecture that would cause me physical pain to hear. Is there a single act of sincerity in this art? Is there nothing these people do that's not wrapped in thousands of layers of cynicism and irony? <laughs> ah! ah! Get me out of here. Finally, you're apprehended by the lead academic, whose name is Dr. Zhu. He begins to chase you through hall after hall, all while he waxes philosophically about how they will usher in the new age of murder. They will be the hands of the killer. He's even seen the killer once, and refers to him as the world spirit. Finally, Bibi finds a last resort. She'll reset the power and open the anti-killer mechanisms. Almost immediately, we see an entity enter. A frightening, enormous vulture-headed creature? Dr. Zhu identifies this as the killer, remarking that the years have changed it not at all, perhaps indicating the killer is something beyond human. Well, Dr. Zhu's been taken care of, but now Bibi has a much bigger problem. We continue to evade the killer and take to the vents, where we can see it chasing us. It seems to know where we are. 
hunting by smell alone, perhaps. And then we fall a million feet conveniently back into Bibi's apartment. Safe. For now. So that's where the second episode of the Killer Anthology ends, and although we've learned some more things about the world, it seems we have even more questions now. Is all of academia compromised? Does every society have a dark secret where they worship the killer? First the managers of the life insurance firm and now this? Is the killer supernatural? Is it a metaphor for something? Is Bibi a human or a living doll? What is going on? Well, no choice but to press ahead. On to Drool, probably the most linear of the bunch, but it's a strange one. Bibi, with her extrasensory perceptive abilities, has noticed there's a strange bus line that no one seems to know any details about. The bus simply reads, Tammy, where does it go? Of course, she decides to investigate up close and hops on the bus, falling asleep on the way and waking up in a strange location. The sign out front says it's a water park, and it's open, and also, I died in 1992. We enter and see not Donald Duck, and pretty much immediately begin our journey into the depths of Tammy. This particular chapter is unique because Bibi loses her senses pretty much immediately, succumbing to the psychoactive effects of the water park, or Tammy, or the pool rooms, or whatever this is. Bibi wanders deeper and deeper into the slippery maze, learning only snippets here and there. This building used to be a furniture store, and it seems like Tammy was a victim of the omnipresent killer? Drowned in a lake, only to resurface as some sort of water spirit. Bibi's mind is frayed somehow under the influence of Tammy, but also coherent enough to recognize the danger and run. Bibi is confronted by watery visions in and out of the pipes, underwater in the belly of the forgotten furniture factory. Tammy speaks to us directly now, telling us she will usher in a new age. A new age with Economy 2, where water parks play an important pivotal role. Again with the ushering in a new age, it seems like everyone in this world is eager to get out of it. Finally, with their back against the wall, Bibi is trapped in an old closet with chlorine bottles. Only to find out Tammy isn't chlorinated anymore. This snaps Bibi out of the mesmer and she furiously bonks Tammy escaping the complex with a long walk ahead of her. This one is weird. Outright supernatural entities are definitely confirmed here, but what is Tammy's place in the larger picture? Is she somehow a result of the killer? What is this new age everyone is talking about? It would seem this is a world of chaos. There's not just the one capital K killer to worry about, but plenty of other evil entities as well. All right, well, time to move on. This one opens with a mysterious pre-title screen intro saying that it's your turn to serve in the immersive theater, whatever that is. We play from a first-person perspective as a guest enters this immersive theater, whatever that might be. We wander around the halls, picking up nonsensical dialogue from actors, observing bits of the story play out around us. Count Masco has some unwanted party guests. Mr. Sun and Mr. Moon. There's this guy who's... prison man. He says... <laughs> There's also this servant girl who just says core blimey, uh, great show. Anyway, it's time for refreshments, so let's wander along. Hmm, down this hall? Around this corner? Uh-oh. I sure hope those bears I saw earlier don't. Oh no. It turns out it's all just part of the show. We finally found out that BB was the mop girl all along. She's got just one more show until her contract with the immersive theater is over, but in classic BB fashion, she's frustrated and wants to know who kills her character. In an immersive theater, the actors are not allowed to know more than their characters, so BB goes on the hunt for info. 
Bibi Bee Bee forces her sister Zizi, who's also taking her turn in immersive theater, I guess, to take over her role while she goes undercover as a guest at the theater to figure out the plot. She wanders around backstage wondering where all the money for this comes from. Who comes to these plays anyways? Also, look, working mirrors. Modern developers take note. Also, I want this painting. This painting speaks to me on a deep level. I need this painting. As Bibi moves through the immersive play, we find out an exchange between the mysterious mouse Mappy and Count Masco that apparently the Count summoned and bound the mighty elemental prison man. And now to get rid of the pesky Mr. Sun and Mr. Moon, he's going to unbind him and just hope for the best? Some bad advice from Mappy there. Bibi descends deeper into the belly of the theater, unsure of what is reality and what is the play. Bibi encounters Prison Man again and is terrified. What? What's happening? A small line from Bibi clues us in on the nature of the immersive theater. Whatever this thing is, you're drafted into it one month at a time. After wandering maze-like corridors, finally Bibi falls into a trap door and is met with a gruesome scene. It's Cool Cop and the police from Chapter 1, and they're grinding up a bunch of bodies? Bibi's terrified and they give chase. During this sequence, all the playgoers will comment on how fantastic the spectacle of the chase is and how it's a metaphor for audience culpability and Bibi's eventual demise. Also, if you get caught here, Bibi does a little substitution jutsu and switches herself with a sandbag. Finally, Bibi escapes and luckily finds herself near the office of play director Miss Basso. Miss Basso is only interested in telling Bibi about the strange connection they have. Some hooded academics that met an untimely demise. Yeah, it turns out the academics from part two were but a small branch of the immersive theater. Bibi postulates out loud that the immersive theater is merely a front for the cops, but Director Basso says it's the other way around. They make films for their patrons, and the last one was basically the events of chapter two. Truly, Bibi has uncovered a terrifying ecosystem of murder. Who are these patrons that are ordering death and dismemberment wholesale? Say hello to the Art Appreciator Club. The play culminates in the final act, and then it's over? Bibi gets a lousy $20 for a month of work and gets to go home. So, was any of that real? Was it all just immersive theater? Is there really a blood economy that runs underneath the city? Just how big is this immersive theater faction, and how much power do they have? Do they control the entire underground of the city? The plot really thickens in the fourth act, huh? This one has a cold open. Bibi and three other brightly colored individuals pour out of an enormous crate into what looks to be a museum. As Bibi follows along, they exchange some banter. It turns out this is a covert ops mission. Their objective? Expose and report on a tax-exempt freeport outside of the city being used as a private art gallery for the rich and powerful, all for community college credits. Apparently, the specific art movement they're interested in is moral art, which is surging in popularity, probably due to all the murders. Along the way, BB spots a classic pleasant child and horrible child, no doubt a reference to Goofs and Gallant, a moral art classic from our very own world. Ray says he's always associated more with Goofus. Okay, door's locked, and I guess BB was supposed to be the lockpicking expert, so it's up to her to find a way in. We begin to wander around in search of a keycard, parading through room after room of high art. BB finds a creepy room full of elephant paintings that seem pretty sinister. Upon finding the keycard, it looks like the elephant painting room has been ransacked, and one of the boys is missing. Undaunted, the group presses on through a room with the works of M.T. Lott, who, despite producing all of the most famous moral art, was eventually arrested for eating a woman. Oh. Look who we bumped into. Biblically accurate M.T. Lot. Anyway, he eats us, and now Bibi's a statue, except she can still wander around. We appear to not be in the bowels of a primordial creature, but rather the world of paint. Bibi manages to escape this nightmare world and falls out of a painting back into the gallery, only to find the walls lined with paintings of her. She then wanders into a semi-obvious trap of a painting painted to look like a door. Back into the painted world, I guess. It's okay, she escapes this one as well and is able to reunite with Claude, who's all ready to worship the false idols to get his friends back. Bibi chastises him, lamenting why people in this city can't go 10 minutes without starting a cult. One of life's greatest mysteries, truly. Anyway, back to getting chased by that horrible angel slash lion slash artist slash robot? Along the way, we get some backstory. Apparently, this guy's lore is he watched 1,000 hours of children's cartoon on a dare 
and realize morality is something too important not to be immortalized in works of art. The chase ends by getting dumped into a new painting that looks like the other boys are already in. Uh-oh. Realism. Yeah, the cute cartoon aesthetics are now gone, replaced by weird JPEGs. Bibi remarks that someone is looking at her that she can't see. Life of a painting indeed. We're at an appropriate place for me to remark on just how clever the writing of these games are. It truly is a treat in the world of modern AAA games writing when playing something refreshing like this. The killer anthology doesn't even rely on tired subversion tropes either. It's just scooping out its own place in the history of video games. Bibi's just doing her thing. Anyway, Bibi's getting chased by the weird lion robot angel artist thing. And it looks like it's curtains. But then, upon reuniting with the gang, Bibi has an excellent idea. Perhaps the robot is simply trained to hunt anything not moral. So, the group decides to stage a play about simple morals, mesmerizing the lion. Then, Ray jumps it and is able to defeat the beast. The gang all makes it out and it's a happy ending. M.T. Lot apparently gets made into a children's cartoon, but this adaptation was mostly known for the volume and variety of graphic fan art it inspired. But we don't know anything about that, do we? Man, so what was getting satirized harder in that chapter? High art or morality? It's hard to say with this series. Sometimes it almost feels like satire of satire, but might be getting too deep on that one. Anyway, moving on. We begin in a dream where BB is delivering some sort of package that throbs and wiggles in her pocket. She's startled awake by the movement of the train. She consults her dream interpretation guide. It says, uh, impending death. Anyway, BB's on a little mission to check out what's going on with the zine production in Rivertown. Her contact here is Clarice. Apparently Clarice has not been producing enough and the zine organization is angry. And the zine organization is sending BB here to check out what's going on. Huh, I guess BB wasn't completely independent after all. And of course, is a member of yet another shadowy organization. Anyway, Rivertown is the home of the Drinky Birds, but no time for tourism. Bibi's gotta go find her contact Clar Oh. As per usual, BB gets wrapped in something big. Now she's tailed by this guy, but don't worry, I'm a murderer. This guy mistakes BB for one of his own, I guess? And then, oh, this girl kills him, and what is going on? Now, we get a great sequence where BB is looking at a map of the town and we get to move around and explore locations, like this burned down record store, where we're introduced to Handy and Mandy. Now, Handy and Mandy have accidentally confused BB for a murderer due to her association with Murderer X moments ago. As you might have guessed, a chase sequence ensues. The duo pursue BB through an enormous factory filled with rubber party masks. BB will have a series of terrifying misadventures at each of these spots. In this one, she sees a mysterious man that might be a lead. Then she gets a little chase sequence of her own for once. Here in the markets, we have a nightmare scene where BB encounters... Clarice, maybe? And then we have a reverse chase sequence where we play as the murderer. Really getting a lot of variety out of this chapter. We move on to the Drinky Bird Museum, which is a history of the production of the mechanical birds, and is apparently a lot darker than one would imagine. Wait, these birds are starting to look a little familiar. We're once again met with a strange man who informs us the Drinky Bird factory burned down after the production of the Drinky Bird Mark II. Wait, is the killer the escaped Drinky Bird Mark II? What's going on? But investigation has reached a dead end and we're out of leads. Bibi has a drink at the bar and enjoys amateur music hour only to see Handy and Mandy once again. She decides to skip town entirely, calling the whole thing a bus and hops on the train, only to end up in the mysterious Drinky Bird factory. Uh-oh. But Bibi's not dead and makes her way to find Clarice? Time to solve the mystery once and for all, right? So it turns out that was once Clarice, but the guy who's the heir to the drinky fortune figured out how to replace people with strange machines that have the face and body but obey him. This is the Drinky Bird Mark II process, apparently. Then he accuses Bibi of being the one who burned everything down in the town. I wonder who that could have been. Bibi's finally in over her head. No getting out of this one, right? Well, turns out Clarice has a bit of ego left after all and saves BB. Man, so what what did we learn from this one? That was the closest call yet. I think BB really is in over her head here. 
So, I guess this bizarre murder-based society is at least partially organized, because Murderer X seemed to identify Bibi as one of his own, whatever one of his own might be. And also, is the killer an animatronic drinky bird? Is he taking orders from someone? What's going on? Bibi stares at her ceiling in a murderous rage. Her upstairs neighbors have kept her up for three days by playing insanely loud music. Her blood is boiling. She's ready to kill. She's ready to slip a passive-aggressive note under the door. So off we go. Journey started. A rather clandestine issue for Bibi. Very normal. Nothing weird could happen. Oh, it's a flesh room. Oh, it's uh, it's one of those. Huh? <laughs> These games are getting more and more abstract as we go. Is that the, the killer? He then force feeds us a bird, which turns us into a pop star sensation. Except for BB wasn't conscious for any of it. And then we're in the apartment and Zizi is getting a job at a new age wellness company, fulfilling her ambitions of becoming an OL office lady. BB turns the internet to research the source of it all. The record the upstairs neighbors were playing by Blue D Hans. Now, the game branches out with multiple characters and routes. Oh yeah, we're 21st century gaming now. Who's that mysterious character in the middle, though? Hmm. Alright, well, let's tackle Zizi's adventure first. She's off to the beach to find this mysterious company she's now employed by. After searching the town high and low, she finally finds this mysterious gold prospector looking dude. Well, here's the website we're in charge of now, and it's a very faithful recreation of 90s internet. Zizi gets a bad feeling about this whole thing and goes to demand the money up front, and as you may be expecting at this point, the building is a nightmarish maze. Eventually she confronts the old timer, who was lamenting the rest of the staff apparently ascending to the next dimension never to return. But then they return. Time to check on BB. BB's got her feet on the pavement of the city, trying to find the record label. As we wander around the street, we're treated to a wonderful cavalcade of characters, and this is the first real opportunity for the series to kind of just stretch out and show us what's out there. And of course, it does not disappoint. I love the aesthetics and the imagination of the characters in this series, and especially the city goers in this little jaunt. Eventually, BB finds the music label slash coffin warehouse. As per usual, the label is ushering in a new age of music. It seems like just about every organization is all about ushering in a new age. Perhaps this is what it's like to live in a time of decay. Everyone's just focused on the rebirth. And of course, the label's gimmick is they've replaced the stars with dancing corpses on strings. Alright, now we've unlocked the ability to play as Unidentified Corpse. We enter a world of recollection, the previous life of an artist in horror-themed novelty records. The corpse waxes poetic about the band The Cat People, and about how the scene fell apart. And this is one of the things I love about the series. This is objectively one of the stupidest things I've ever heard, and yet this moment was beautiful all the same. Picking things back up is easy, she's transformed the website into a very sleek modern operation, and things around the company are looking up as well. She goes to talk with the boss, and we get what may be one of my favorite singers in the series. Zizi, you know it's rare we get someone of your entrepreneurial abilities joining a death cult. They generally prefer to start their own. Tasked with finding more stuff in the basement to sell, everything must go, Zizi of course has another hellish adventure in the negative department where everyone has become so negative they've vanished. Back to Bibi, somehow, and for some reason she's at a convention? A sale for serial killers? She observes that somehow her alter ego is still producing music. Anyway, Manning the booth bores her so she slips off. There's a bunch of funny visual gags here too, with all the weird characters in the junk they peddle. Eventually she gets accosted by a dog-faced man and runs off into a hallway to dodge him, only to be confronted by Weepster, her rival in the music scene. The Weepster is another in a long line of serial killers making music with the tears he sheds for his victims. This of course initiates another chase sequence, the most inventive yet. Now, it's time to confess to you dear viewer, no, I don't know what's going on anymore either. Is this a critique of the music label industry? What does the murderverse mean metaphorically? As we descend further and further into madness, I'm afraid you're on your own. I don't have the answer, I'm merely along for the ride. And oh, would you look at that? The bird the killer forced BB to swallow has now musically turned the turntables on the Weepster and now we're chasing him. Suddenly, we're in a bizarre dream sequence. I don't know how to explain this anymore. Your guess is as good as mine. Then we're on the beach. Turns out all those guys from the company think it's too early for an age of Aquarius and they're not to return for another 50,000 years. Eventually, BB links back up with ZZ. ZZ is busy liquidating everything and she wants to make one last sale. They go to the planetarium to seal the deal, and of course they bump into this guy, the late great Blue D. Hans. He wants BB and ZZ for the band, where they're playing to 
literally a new wave audience. Like all things, it's over before you know it. The only indication that anything mysterious occurred was a Beach Boys revival for the summer. Yeah, uh, I don't really know what to say about this one. There's a lot going on and I can explain none of it. There is no choice but to press ahead. Now, I know by this point some of you are ready to wife BB up, so don't get too excited by this title screen. It opens with a brief dream, and then BB awakens in a strange place. Strange because she's in the dream resort. She wanders the empty halls, observing the beautiful scenery, statues, contemplating who to call on the dial a boy, enjoying the wondrous soundtrack, and filling out surveys. Because, as we see in a flashback, BB has taken up employment as a mystery shopper. In another great sequence, we see BB play out her role. But sick of the job, she goes to quit, only to get pulled back in for one more job at the Dream Resort. BB spends her days in leisure. Her only responsibility is to respond to focus group surveys where she's asked to rate items on a scale of fear or desire. While taking a bathroom break, BB makes contact with the first other person she's seen here, a girl named Cece that also runs a zine about the many mysterious events that happen, all seemingly linked to a murderer. She tells BB to meet her here the next day for the full scoop. However, during the night, BB hears the dial boy ringing and has a terrifying encounter with something, only to wake up in an entirely different bed? Where is she? Fortunately, she's able to find the bathroom from before, but Cece is nowhere to be found. However, behind the mirror, she finds a secret passage, and of course, it leads to a secret room with the original scene that started it all, and documents detailing a spook? A strange entity that seems to possess plastic bags to move around. BB resolves to leave that night, fleeing the spook out onto the rooftops, narrowly avoiding its grasp. She once again refuses to make a choice on the dial boy and is confronted by a mysterious figure who sends her to the Shadow Realm. Yep, this is still the same game. <laughs> Bibi must then navigate this bizarre 3D world, remarking about how strange it is to her 2D sensibilities. In this geometrically expanded reality, Bibi is now a hotshot rider, coming back home to connect with her small town roots. Greg from high school has been asking about her. And he's chasing us now. Turns out that the mysterious corporate figure was Marcy from the first magazine that started it all, paying off some publishing debts with her new business an erotic horror-themed fantasy for film and service, which is just apparently what you do in the new murder economy. But BB's desires are not so easily met. Suddenly the spook goes rogue and sucks them both into... the dream of the spook? Marcy tells BB that the spook is the culmination of all the market research of a generation. The data of desire of the whole world conglomerated into a super entity capable of telling you exactly what it is that you want. She invites BB into this dark tower, her one opportunity to reveal to herself just what it is she seeks. However, BB declines, and Marcy laments, Such is the privilege of youth, never having to recognize yourself. But you will try to find this place again, BB, perhaps in your dreams. And then, BB wakes up. The hotel vanished, sinking into the forest, nature reclaiming its own. This one was heavy. Just what is it that we want? Is the thing we want the most of all to be told exactly what it is we desire? This is it. The final chapter. Does this all wrap up somehow? Do these stories get connected? Are all the questions answered? Well, here we go. We start in another first person sequence. The result of an unbelievable murder rate is finally catching up. We appear to be raiding one of these abandoned buildings, perhaps to finally catch the killer once and for all and put an end to the madness. One by one, we get picked off. Wait, is that? We fall into a chasm and land in a lake of blood and bodies. Unbelievably catastrophic violence perpetuated for who knows how long has finally resulted in this a miasma of flesh. Oh my god, is that BB? Uh oh, it was just a movie. Well, I guess that tracks. We know she got movies made about her previous escapades in Chapter 2, but this was kind of weird. 
Anyway, looks like the gang is graduating, navigating the maze of a once thriving academia to pick up their diplomas. Since most of the faculty is dead, things are tough. The gang are all working now and have depressing soul-sucking jobs that all revolve around the murder economy. BB then explains that by accidentally starring in that movie, slowly over time, her visage has begun to be equated with the very concept of murder itself, sort of like Jason or Michael Myers in her own slasher flicks. However, BB gets no residuals from that and is forced to work at a medieval-themed restaurant. BB is in the middle of telling a story about a no doubt terrifying and harrowing near-death experience when Ray cuts her off. He tells the gang that as the only youth the city has left, it's their duty to party on graduation night. So, off to the mansion gardens. Of course, it's a costume party. Fortunately, BB bears strong resemblance to a certain popular horror icon, and there's actually a few other BBs running around as well. At the house party, we get some lore tidbits. Apparently, during her college career, BB spent most of it getting chased by various maniacs and talking to herself, so I guess these last chapters were the highlights of her college years? This party might be the scariest situation BB has been in yet. She's feeling pretty awkward and not exactly fitting in with the rest of her peers who seem to know exactly where their lives are headed. To cope with this, BB gets a little drunk and ends up watching the commencement speech from... Mappy? The thing from the immersive theater? Is he the architect of the murderverse? He introduces the descendant of Charlemagne, the killer, as heir to the throne of his new kingdom, founded on the myth of violence. Then, the longest chase scene of the series kicks in, with BB absolutely tormented by anyone and everyone that wants a piece. She's ultimately rescued by an unlikely pair, Handy and Manny to the rescue. Apparently they were able to survive and come back from the dead because they're medical experts? And also, the dead walk the earth now. BB then bumps into the killer's understudies at, you guessed it, the immersive theater. Remember, no Russian. BB finally gets the scoop from the immersive theater crowd. They're staging a coup against the leaders of the city who have grown so powerful, they have insulated themselves against history itself and no longer believe it exists, dreaming their lives away in the depths of their seclusion. And that's what the immersive theater was all along? Soothing the dreams of these leaders that they may yet rest in their slumber? Basso becomes enraged with BB and there's a big chase sequence and BB finally fights back for once, getting the upper hand in a sword duel. But moving on, it's getting harder and harder to distinguish reality. The immersive theater is moving so many elements. Is all the world to play and this is merely the stage? Well, reunited once again with Cool Cop and it looks like this is a double coup d'etat. Cool Cop is looking to seize control of the city and usher in a new age of law. He says the owners of the city whispered to him in the static. This world is tired of the Age of Horror. He covers BB with blood and sends her into a flesh tunnel, presumably, to find the owners. As they travel down into this abyss of history, Cool Cop drops one of the coldest monologues of all time. Now I've peered into the true depths of suffering that make up the world. I'm stoic, realistic. At least now I know just how bad it can get. <laughs> and every time I said that, I'd find out the truth was worse, worse, and worse. An ocean of blood that went down forever. And as I looked into it, I discovered the higher dimension to police work. I found out that the capacity for happiness was finite, while the capacity for misery was infinite. And that waiting in the bottomless pit of infinity was the unspeakable policeman known as God. Anyway, then a whole bunch of crazy stuff happens. BB has the shot of a lifetime and... Oh. Then Dr. Zhu, Tammy, and the killer's ghost are all there, happy to usher in the new age, which is just an age of inverted colors. The new world indeed. <laughs> Anyway, we skipped over a whole bunch of stuff, and this entire video has just been a Cliff Notes version of these games, so I hope you go and enjoy them for yourself. 
But now with the main story out of the way, we can go back and check out the bonus rooms, which is a neat little area where we can get some insight into the game. First of all, we can play as a bunch of different characters and also basically every sprite the BB's ever had. Then, if you need some lore spelled out for you, you can go check out the statues, which give you insight into all of the characters of the game. You can also look around and check out the assets, such as the paintings, the carpets, the sounds, the various characters of the world. It's all good fun. There's even a section that explores the many iterations the game went through. I guess at one point these were RPG Maker games, and thank God they evolved beyond that. So is that it? Well, there's one little section left. Let's play it out.